Good evening. Welcome to the third session of the Zero Point Energies section of the Extraordinary Technology Conference 2014. I'd like to introduce you to William Alec. He'll be lecturing on Zero Point Energy and Over Unity Technologies. He does host a radio show on this subject and he's well versed in all of the various fields that we've been, we've been discussing and he's going to be sharing with us some wonderful secrets tonight. So I'd like you to give a warm welcome to, Dr. to William Alec. Well, thank you. Thank you, Vernon. Free energy and over unity technologies. Well, just to give you a little background about myself, how I got interested in this field. Uh, for about 25 years, I've been working at as a uh, hardware software engineer. I have a degree in electrical engineering from Illinois Institute of Technology. And, um, you know, I never really heard about Tesla and his work. It was never mentioned uh, during the course of um, my a academic, uh, you know, learning. Uh, Tesla was just never mentioned. And uh, I never really heard about Tesla until I attended a conference um, about, um, 15, about 15 years ago. I met uh, a researcher by the, by the name of Tom Beard and he was the one who really turned me on to this field. And of course, Tom wrote a lot of papers describing what's called the Floyd Sweet device. And uh, you can see all those papers, they're all, they're all available on the internet. And uh, Floyd Sweet, you know, he's a very interesting character here. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on, you know, Floyd Sweet's background or you know, the life and times of Floyd Sweet, I want to get right to the technical details. And uh, that's what my presentation is going to be about. And so, uh, revealing the secrets, you know, of, uh, you know, Floyd Sweet's technology. And of course, Floyd, he developed this technology back in the mid-80s. And for about four or five years, he developed various sorts of models based on his technology. And, um, and since that time, he passed away back in the 90s. And um, Tom Bearden got to see his work firsthand and um, wrote about it. And um, the technical details, you know, it, it seemed like Tom Bearden just, you know, they kind of skirted around the edge. You know, they, they didn't really go into the details you know, about how his device worked. So I got into this free energy, you know, from his lecture, and I started experimenting. I'm more of an experimentalist, and uh, seeing what works and what doesn't work. And so uh, I give, gave presentations, you know, over the years here, and uh, finally uh, ran across this device, very close to this uh, Floyd Sweet device, you know, and how his technology really worked. So I thought maybe we get into it here. This is the slide on uh, Floyd Sweet's device. Uh, this is Floyd. Uh, he's a retiree. Uh, again, you can see his background on the internet there. Uh, he developed something called free energy over unity technology. And I'll get into that a little later on details of what that means. Uh, he developed this back in the mid 80s, like I mentioned. His device had an input of 10 volts AC uh, RMS at one milliamp. And he had this phenomenal output of 120 volt AC at around 40 amps. I mean, that's incredible. A power output of 5,000 amps from these devices he's been building. And so he called his device the Space Quanta Modulator. And, you know, when you start looking at the architecture of his device, okay, you see the uh, arrangement that he has here. What he really has are a set of double coils. And you'll see that in all his devices. And so, um, again, he called it the Space Quantum Modulator. It had these double input coils and double output coils. It had this 
amaze and efficiency of 50 million percent. I mean, this is unheard of in mainstream science, unheard of. I mean, you're lucky to get something that's maybe 90, 95 percent efficient. That's the best that mainstream science, the engineering world can do. But here he's got something that's 50 million percent that's incredible. Here's a photo of one of his devices. Looks like it's a, uh, a complete unit here. That's his space quantum modulator there. And then he's got these other sort of support circuits. So he builds these little test platforms, probably most likely little demonstration units. Here's another photo of a unit he built. And what you'll see here, when you start to look closely, you know, at, at what he's doing here, you'll see a set of coils here, coils here, and there's, looks like a couple of sets of coils in here. And of course, he's using these magnets you know, on top and bottom. And we'll get into the details of that a little later here. But this is his whole device. I mean, it's no more than, um, than what, less than 12 square inches. And this thing cranks out 5,000 watts? <laughs> How does he do it? Now, when we start to dissect his device, what we see here is that he's got the two coil arrangements here and here. These are two output coils. And then he's got these two, what he calls, conditioned magnets. And I looked into that. And I came to the conclusion that what Floyd is really doing with these magnets is that he's, you know, these, mag these are hard permanent magnet, uh, magnet blocks. And the ones that he uh, was using in his device here are, are barium ferrite magnets. And today you can mostly get, I think, strontium, but the, it's a much harder material. And so with the barium magnets, it's, uh, you can demagnetize them much easier. And that's what Floyd was doing, is that what he would do is soften the side that's nearest these coils. He would soften the surface. So in other words, he would take the permanent out of the, out of the magnet. Uh, he would lessen the coercive force okay, on these magnets, and he would soften them. So you would end up with a soft ferrite surface that, that can be manipulated by fields produced by these double coil arrangements. Now here's a circuit. You can find this at Rex Research. This is a, a circuit diagram of what Floyd was doing. And when you go back uh, to this diagram here, go back to this diagram yeah right here is that you see this this double arrangement here and here double coils there and you see that in this schematic in his electrical schematic so you have this this the two outer coils here and here and then the two center coils are right here and it looks like he's using some nomenclature here, like they're bifiler type arrangements. And bifiler uh, is a key ingredient for building over unity devices, and I'll get into that a little later. So then you see a couple of extra little coils here and here. And people over the years have been trying to figure out, you know, what's Floyd doing here? And then he's driving it with what appears to be an AC signal uh, produced by this switching. This, this could be uh, an AC generator source, a little tabletop generator. That outputs about maybe uh, 15 volts AC. And uh, Floyd, I believe, used about 60 hertz household uh, current. And so he's driving this output here into this coil arrangement here and here. Now, I built, you know, these free energy type devices. 
And so I've got a background in how these devices work. So now I'm able to look back at the Floyd Sweet device and dissect it and come up with the correct interpretation of what Floyd's doing here. And so I took his diagram, okay, and rewrote it here. And so what you see is an AC source, this coil arrangement that he has on the outer side, and then the inner arrangement looks like this. And then he has something that looks like a feedback arrangement here and here. Now when I look at this, uh, Faraday's law always rules transformers. So in other words, when you look at Faraday's law, you got a flux. A chain, it has to be a changing flux. So when you look at permanent magnets, you know, the flux isn't changing unless there's some sort of a rotation involved. But Floyd Sweet device, you know, there's no rotation going on here. You know, it's just a, a fixed device here. There's no moving parts. So when I started looking at his circuit, I came to the conclusion that the left and right side is nothing more than a transformer arrangement. So what he's doing is just stepping up the voltage from seven and a half because he's splitting he's splitting the voltage from a 15 volt source he's splitting it on the left and right side they're both uh, about seven and a half volts AC and then he steps it up with the 2000 turn coil here and here and then he takes the output of that which is already producing 60 volts on both sides and when you add the two you get a 120 volt AC household current but then he takes the output of this transformer stage here and here, and then he drives this coil arrangement here and here. Now this is very important because in order to operate the output on, on these coils has to have a changing flux. You have to put flux into these coils in order to get a transformer transformation on your output. So when you look at Faraday's law here, to get a voltage output on his device, you would have the EMF, which is an open circuit voltage, equals N times the changing flux or the changing time. Classic Faraday's law. The negative sign there is, of course, Lentz's law. So we have flux getting into his circuit here and here. Now this double coil arrangement, as I said before, is very important. You have to have it in these type of systems. The double coil arrangement here is that he has the magnets positioned on the top and the bottom of his circuit. So what he's doing in this arrangement is that he is pumping these ferromagnetic blocks, the softened side of these ferromagnetic blocks. He's pumping it with flux produced here and here. So the pump pumping arrangement is up here into the blocks, into the bottom blocks. And that's, that's a key component with building over unity devices. I mean, almost device, about every device that I built, there is a pumping action you got going on with your flux fields. So Floyd Sweet, it, it, there's no difference here. So really the technology goes all the way back to the 80s. This technology, over unity technology, has been around for a long time. So the other thing that I did with Floyd Sweet's device here is that I also put the, uh, the dots and how the coils are wound. And you don't really get that from, um, you know, Floyd's device here. You know, this, his arrangement confuses a lot of people because you think, well, maybe it's a normal transformer arrangement. Then you start to look at it to a little, fur uh, little further and then you get really confused and you don't really know and then you get all these bizarre interpretations on the internet of the Floyd Sweet device and none of them really work.
So what I did is I come along and I put the dots. You know, I show uh, the polarity, you know, on these transformers. Uh, the direction of a, you know, if I had a, a snapshot of the current flow, the, this is the direction that the current would actually flow, okay, through the device. So here you have Faraday action on the output, Faraday's law here, producing voltage and your direction of currents, and how closely this resembles, this design here, how this closely resembles Floyd Sweet's design. So in my design here, I show the position, well, I show how the, the direction of all the coils and the position of the magnets. And also in Floyd Sweet design, it looks like he was using, um, you know, he wasn't using any sort of uh, ferrite core material or iron, um, transformer iron. It looked like he wasn't using that in his device. And that the ferro, magnetic material that he was using is maybe represented by this. So really what he was doing is that he's setting up these pump fields. He's not really directing it into ferrite material or iron that you would have with a normal transformer because you wouldn't have any flux leakage. But with the Floyd Sweet system, this was like an open air type of device. So here he is, he's got this pumping action going on that's producing a field all around his device. Okay, the field is really all around this device where he's getting this pumping action. So, what we have here is, uh, this, this may in fact be his representation of the magnets that are on the top and the bottom and that he w really wasn't using any sort of ferrite material other than the magnets. But if you wanted to just contain the flux, the field, you would use ferrite material, okay, or transformer material, such that you wouldn't get all this flux leakage and, you know, interference from the device because this device is radiating, okay, it's radiating these pump fields. So if you wanted to contain a quiet device, you would use uh, either ferrite or magnetic core material. I like to use met glass myself. Met glass is pretty nice stuff. Okay, so Tom Bearden came up with this analysis a number of years ago, I think back in the 90s, and he wrote about this that he shows this pumping action that Floyd Sweet is using. And then he calls this material in between there a nonlinear medium or this ferrite block that he's using, this barium ferrite block. And of course it has to be softened such that you get this interaction going with this pumping action here. And so what Tom was showing is that, you know, hey, you know, we're Floyd Sweet's device is working with something known as negative energy, whatever, whatever that is, right? And we studied this in electrical engineering, okay? It's called a phase conjugated wave. And uh, I remember working with these waves. It's only a theoretical abstract, you know, in our textbooks. You know, there's nothing real about it, right? Well, maybe there is something real going on here. Because Tom was showing that if you work with this phase conjugated component, which is everywhere, that there's a time reversed process going on here. Time reversal, what the heck is that? And so, you know, we get into something that's called dark energy. What is dark energy? You know, even a physicist won't even tell you what dark energy is. What dark energy is, is that what we see here, and we just studied this, you know, you have something called a time-reversed wave, and Tom, and Tom talked about that all the time. And what that is is that you have time-forward waves, electromagnetic waves, moving forward in time, 
but a time reversed wave is an electromagnetic wave moving backwards in time that there are certain nuclear events recoilless nuclear events that produce time forward and time reverse radiation so what you have are these overlapping waves that are everywhere present everywhere when you look at a distant star in the universe astronomers physicists will tell you that you're looking backwards in time and that light from that star you know maybe 500 500 light years away occurred 500 years ago well dark energy is just the opposite of that dark energy is coming from a source not from the past but from the future that there's this wave traveling backwards in time and that when we perceive that and some remote viewers have that capability of remote viewing not only the past but the future that they're also looking at this dark energy aspect that they're looking at something from the future that is going to happen but is being perceived in their mind perhaps the pineal gland is perceiving this dark energy from a vent from the future of light being emitted okay that's time reversed and that you know what's going to happen in the future from these remote viewers because of some distant object you know some astronomical object maybe a million light years away you're perceiving dark energy from that object that it's waves traveling backwards in time of something that's going to happen a million years into the future that's dark energy so that's what uh, could be working with here and this is what Tom talks about so it's a he calls us a phase conjugated mirror and it's somewhat understood in physics they're able to do it at the uh, I think microwave or light level well we're looking at something going on here at the low frequency level you know something that we can tap into from an energetic aspect so really I got this slide from Tom Bearden's work okay room temperature superconductivity there's another mystery there you know what we have what you know if you caught Thurston's lecture you know he talked a little bit about the electron okay that there's I believe three aspects that describe an electron and the two are covered here and you know what creates resistance in wires well you have an electron it's like a, it behaves like a little gyroscope because it has angular momentum it's spinning you know Thurston said that you know you got angular momentum then you also have this property called spin which means that uh, the electron is polarized you know it has a north and south pole and of course that's a key feature when you describe superconductivity is that what forms in superconductors naturally is what, what they call the Cooper pair and it's like two electrons we have two electrons little gyroscopes that are kind of loosely coupled together now you pr you're probably very familiar with how a gyroscope operates when you rev it up it has a like a resistance to it in space I mean there's no difference between this and an electron I mean it has angular momentum and it has this resistance so if you apply a force an electric force to this electron it wants to move in a circular type fashion okay it's it's orbiting an atom and it gives resistance to motion you know when you try to rotate it but you see with the Cooper pair you have a different phenomenon occurring see with the Cooper pair you have opposing 
fields, and then you also have opposing angular momentum. That's also key in this free energy field because free energy is also related to anti-gravity technology. That's the next step beyond free energy. Of course, Floyd Sweet talked about that too. You know, if you see that in some of his papers, he talked about anti-gravity. Then when he shorted the output on his 5,000 watt generator, the device lost like 90% of its weight. So there's uh, a correlation going on here. So what happens with the Cooper pair? What's different about this? Angular momentum is gone. When you apply electric force to this, this coupling, there's no resistance. There's no resistance in the wire, okay? Because uh, the properties are gone. So with the regular gyroscope, you have this resistance going on. But with the Cooper pair, there's no resistance at all. That's very key, because in UFO-type technologies, this plays a very important role. And of course, that's what Floyd Sweet was getting into, because the field, he really wasn't using any sort of ferrites to direct the field into. He was just using open-air coils, so the field was all around his device. What do you think would happen if you step into that field? Because really, you're creating this Cooper pair at a room temperature. This is what Floyd Sweet was doing in his devices, creating Cooper pairs. What do you think would happen if your brain was in, in this field of these Cooper pairs? Your brain would start to superconduct. Okay, you start to expand your consciousness. There's consciousness expansion going on here. So we're dealing with the technology, okay? When you deal with UFOs, you're dealing with the technology. When you deal with free energy, it's a technology, okay? We're manipulating space that's around these devices. Okay, so we're looking at room temperature superconductivity. That's amazing. Of course, electrons, when you look at the lattice materials and superconductors, of course, these electrons are moving in parallel. But in bifilar type coil arrangements, they're, they're moving in opposite directions. So still, you still have this Cooper pair formations occurring. And you still have this field, this cancellation. And again, you know, what I want to say here is that what's very important that's going on here is that when you look at gravity, I look at gravity as a torsion field phenomenon. So in other words, when you look at fundamental particles, they're wrapping the ether as they spin at high velocities. They wrap the ether around these particles. So really, you're, we're in a torsion field right now, standing on the Earth. You know, these are it's an attractive field because it changes the density of the ether around these particles as they spin. So then, what's happening in anti-gravity? You know, these anti-gravitational effects. Well, it's a cancellation of this spinning action. That's what we're seeing here. That's what we see with the Cooper pair, is a cancellation of angular momentum. So that's another key component of this technology. There's a number of things you've got to understand about free energy. And one of them is this cancellation of angular momentum. You know, this, it's like a stress relief in the field that's occurring. So what's really producing gravity is, of course, angular momentum in these fundamental particles. It's a twisting that's occurring, a torsion, a twisting in the, in the ether. Okay, now this fellow came, came along back in the mid-2000s here, and he came out with this device called a bitoroid transformer. 
And it's my understanding that this fellow, Thane Hines, his main focus is on rotary type devices. And that he came up with this design here of a solid state application. And he calls it the, uh, the bitoroid transformer. And if you look up his patents, you'll notice that none of them are granted. And the question, well, why is that? Well, when you start looking at the language he used, I mean, you know mainstream science is just going to reject that. They don't accept anything that's over unity. That's crazy. So here he's got this transformer. He's tested it. It's been third party tested by the uh, defense ministry in Canada. You know, Thane Hines is a Canadian. You know, it has transformer technology tested by lab. And find that finds out that the thing is over unity. And there's a one test that shows that it's like 2,700% right there on the internet. You can get his data right there off the internet. 2,700% over unity. So this is why, you know, this, this is where I got into it. And, uh, you know, again, I, I want to say that, you know, if you look up his patents, they're all dead. You know, they're dead patents. You know, they're automatically rejected, okay, by the patent office. So last year, um, I started testing these devices. And lo and behold, yes, they're over unity. So um, my partner and I, Aurora Light, we got together and we formed a corporation here called Aurora Tech. You can see our display. We've got a display here down the hall. You can see our technology. And see, my background is in engineering. You know, I do hardware, software, computer work. I did that for, you know, since I graduated back in uh, 79. You know, I've been involved in computer work, you know, since that time. And I do hardware, you know, well, my degree is in electrical engineering. And so I do uh, hardware design work. Uh, I got into software back in the late 80s. So I got a software background. Probably worked for one of the best software companies around, Motorola, their automotive division. And uh, I have a, quite a diverse background programming little chips. So I said, you know what, I'm going to design a little chip that can control these devices. Of course, of course, you know, Floyd Sweetie didn't, didn't have that background. Most people, most experimenters don't have a background that I have, okay, doing this work. So I can, I can do the whole thing. I can build the transformers, build the circuit boards, write the software. I worked for one of the best software companies on the planet, you know, Motorola at that time. So Aurora and I, we got together and we decided, look, we're going to form a corporation here and we're going to market this technology and we're going to address this issue because I don't know if you're aware of this, but the people up there at the top they know that everything's coming to an end, okay, because of finite resources. So they're all lining up at the top to manage the decline of our civilization. It's going to happen. So the question is, what's going to replace? What's going to be the replacement technology? The only thing that's out there <laughs> is uh, free energy. The energy source has to be free, okay? And the reason why it has to be free, it's very simple, is because we have to change the system. And the system is based on scarcity. Scarcity of resources. Food, water, air, energy, the basic sources, they're all made scarce. Scarcity creates money, all right? So what these billionaires are doing, they're all lining up to manage the decline of our civilization. Because we know we only have about maybe 50 years of oil left. The experts all know that. So it's all coming to an end. So we need to change this system, okay? This economic system that we're in. And this technology is going to do that. 
okay? Because the energy source is free, it's all around us. We just need to know how to tap into that source. And so that's what we're doing here. That's why I'm into this. It's kind of like a rescue mission that Aurora and I are on. We don't care about the black ops. Okay, we don't care about them. Um, we had our place broken into by black ops. Okay, because Aurora's into the UFO field. She's an expert in the UFO field. She's been watched for decades by the black ops. Watch very closely because they are very, very, very afraid of this UFO phenomena. And don't kid yourself, they are. And they're very aware of it, the UFO phenomena. We're being visited all the time. They have this technology. They come and go from the planet as they choose. You got the good ones and you got the bad ones out there. So, you know, Roar and I, we decided, well, we're going to form this corpora corporation. We're going to get this technology out there. So we started up uh, back in September. Aurora is incredible with, um, with her network. I mean, she's plugged into the, into the Christian New Age movement, because those are the people that really know what's going on. The, re the religion that's out there believe in this abstract, etheric God, okay? Well, we're kind of into this, um, well, what I would say, extraterrestrials, advanced spiritually and technically. They can come and go with the planet as they choose. They have the technology. And that's what I think we're evolving into, is that in order to meet on their level, you have to be technically evolved enough, okay, to meet with them on their level. And that's what we're doing here. We're creating the technology to do that. So we incorporated back in November of 2013. Um, if you're interested in checking our background here, you can do so. Uh, you can contact uh, Aurora. Just give us a call. And um, you can become more involved in our corporation. There's sales and distributions and things of that nature, you know, the business aspects of it. Self-sustainability. See, that's, that's the key to this next level. Okay, once this age dies, and it's going to die, and all the experts know it's going to die, we need a replacement technology, and that's what we're doing here. So we're looking at self-sustainability. The oil industry, they're on their way out. Nuclear, what are you going to do, contaminate the whole planet? I mean, every time they decommission a nuclear power plant, that is a permanent me monument that will never go away because mainstream science has no idea what to do with all these radioactive components. All that they're doing is just funneling money into Fukushima with all these little band-aids while they just contaminate the ocean. And that's just one power plant. There's just hundreds if not thousands of, planet, of, of these plants scattered around the planet. Renewable energy resources solar, wind, those are all boondoggles, and the experts know that. They're boondoggles, because they're just too expensive to operate. They're not economical. You know, wind turbines, mechanical systems. Solar is just too expensive, and they all know that. So here we have, you know, three major industries supplying power that are dinosaurs. So we have this dinosaur technology here that's going to be replaced. Our mission is to transform the planet with this technology, with clean, safe, abundant source that's all around us. We're tapping into the ether, okay? We're harnessing this. And the objective is to change our current system, our current economic system, and to eliminate scarcity artificial scarcity. 
Okay, that's going to be very important for this new age that's coming along here. Yes, I'm a new ager, a Christian new ager. So here's our technology. We have our utility patent in place. Now, what are we patenting here? Well, you saw a clear example with Thane Hines and his device. You can't say over unity, because right away they start thinking, well, that's perpetual motion. We all, we all know that, well, that's impossible. Because here we're really tapping into a hidden source of energy that's all around us. You know, we, we look at, you know, the second law of thermodynamics. Well, you're violating the third law of God of thermodynamics. You, you can't do that. Well, that's for a closed system. You know, you're looking at a closed system where you know what energy coming in, energy coming out. But what we're doing here is tapping into a source that's all around us, a hidden source. So really, we're, we're kind of modifying the second law of thermodynamics, utilizing this hidden source of energy. So our patent is really covering not, not really our transformers, you know, like in the Floyd Sweet transformer or the Thane Hines transformer. We're patenting our technology where the, what the transformer plugs into, you know, a control system. So you can utilize it in real products, products you can get out there. And you can look at our booth there and see what kind of real products we're talking about. I mean, we have people visiting us from all over the world. They're crazy about this stuff. You know, they're really fascinating. Because I give demonstrations. You can come up to our room here, you know, at the hotel, and you can actually see this technology working. I'll give you a demonstration of it. I'll show you how it works. So our patent is really the control system. Because with the control system and the transformer, that's what's going to transform the planet. I mean, imagine all these municipalities, okay? They all have street lighting systems. Well, we can take our device, our little device, we can put it into a street light module, all right? And every street light can have its own little power source, taking energy from, transforming energy from the vacuum. So what are you doing? You no longer need the grid. Secondly, you no longer need the copper wire infrastructure, okay, that feeds all these lamps, that feeds all these lights. So re you recover all the copper. The thing would pay for itself, all right? Economically, it would pay for itself. You recover all the copper, and each head assembly on a light post would be independently operated, have a little solar detector to detect night and day turn the thing on and off. I mean, right there, it would pay for itself. Everything we look at with this technology is a multi-million, if not a multi-billion dollar deal for transforming the planet. In other words, we're going to get rid of this old infrastructure, okay, of centralized authority of the power grid. Okay, that's all obsolete. Everyone will have their own little power source, as predicted by Isaac Isimov. When was that? Back in the 60s. If you look at our front page, our main page on our website, Isaac Asimov, the famous science fiction writer, and I call the guy a prophet because he predicted this year, 2014, that the electric cord would become obsolete. And when I saw that, I nearly fell off my chair. <laughs> 24 D, that's what we're doing. Our logo is the, is the band sign on the electric plug. Remote viewing? I don't know. Maybe the guy was a prophet or a remote viewer, where he got all his concepts. It's amazing. So, Getting back to our utility patent here, okay, we, you know, we're, we're pat we patented our technology, so that's all in place. You know, you can look at it on the bench there, you know, out there in the, our display. 
that's our uh, utility patent there. A little something from official dumb. Now, this is how we do it. If you were to, if you want to look at one of our demonstrations, uh, you can contact me or Aurora, and we can arrange it. Uh, this is what I do. I show. This is our, our device, our transformer. Device under test, that's called a DUT. And what we do is we feed our AC voltage and current into it, so we're feeding power into our transformer. It's just a four terminal device. And then the output just drives a load, a resistor. We just hook up our meters. So I got fluke uh, meters that I hook up to this. So we know what the, uh, the voltage is. We know what the current is coming in and out. And there's something very important here is that you have to look at the phase angle between the voltage and the current because these devices are called, they're, they're highly reactive devices, meaning that they behave, you know, our transformers, they look like an ordinary inductor on the input stage. They look like an inductor and yet it, it is driving a real power load. <laughs> if I short the output on this device, on our transformers, it does something that no other transformer will do. The efficiency on the transformer increases. It becomes more efficient. The device, it runs cold. It doesn't run hot. You know, it's not like a regular transformer. And what I'll do is demo a regular transformer too. I'll show you what a demo, what, what, the, what a regular transformer will do. And I'll just show you what our transformers will do. There's practically no comparison in its behavior. Even though I'm using the same materials, copper, transformer material, it can be either ferrite or transformer iron, I use MET glass copper wire, just regular magnet wire, and it does these amazing things. The efficiency not only shoots up to infinity, all right? You have a fixed output, it's still driving a load, the maximum load output, but the input side, the efficiency increases to the point where when you do this energy, when you do this power calculation here, you find out that your efficiencies go to infinity and beyond infinity. <laughs> well, what the heck is that, beyond infinity? You know, that's, a, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. What's beyond infinity? <laughs> what's beyond infinity is negative efficiency. All right, that's what's beyond infinity is negative efficiencies because the efficiency calculation goes negative. And how does it go negative? Well, if the phase angle between your voltage and your current goes beyond 90 degrees. At 90 degrees, your efficiency is 100%. Beyond 90 degrees, and I see phase angles on our transformers over 90 degrees, 110, 110 degrees phase shift between the voltage and current. Now the misinterpretation is that, well, it's a delayed, you probably heard of a delayed lens effect, whatever that is, I don't know what that is. But what we're seeing here is a force being applied on these electrons, like a negative force, some sort of negative energy being applied onto these electrons that it's pushing the phase angle beyond 90 degrees, this is amazing. But I could show that to you, it's no problem. Okay, so what's going on in this device? As I previously mentioned, they're highly reactive, meaning that on the input side of our transformers, they look like an inductor, but on the output, it looks like a normal transformer delivering power to a load, and that's what we're doing here, our transformers, uh, the output resistor still gets hot like a normal resistor, 
but the transformer itself doesn't get hot at all. Now, what is a reactive system on the input on these devices? Well, a reactive system means that within this power cycle, that's what we have here, this little graph, these little waveforms here, show an efficiency of 100% because the phase angle between the voltage and the current is 90 degrees. So all the power that I put into it within a cycle here is returning back to the generator. That's what that means, highly reactive. Power goes in, comes out, goes in, goes out, goes in, goes out. The power company hates that. They only want to see real power being dissipated because that's what your meters on your house register. They register real power. If you put this device on your home, <laughs> there's an issue there because it would show up as very little or no power being consumed and yet you're driving watts, if not kilowatts, on the output of this thing. It's just the way it works. So you supply what's called apparent power to your transformers. It's reactive power, apparent power, to your input side on the transformer. And the output, you get real power. It has to be real on the output because you're driving a resistive load. The phase angle is always zero on a resistive load between the voltage and current. So you just do a simple power calculation, voltage times current, RMS values, of course, and it gives you the real power being dissipated in that resistor. Now the output side doesn't go to infinity. Okay, it's only the input side. The output side, you know, it's fixed depends upon the geometry. There's a number of factors that play into these transformers. You know, there's always geometry, the orientation. You know, you were setting up these opposing fluxes in the materials, and it really comes down to opposing magnetic forces, okay, that's produced by the output side. They're ma opposing magnetic forces, and that's what's key to these type of free energy devices. You gotta have that. Okay, so we have this energy, this is an energy flow diagram. And this shows that in reality, we're not really violating uh, the second law of thermodynamics. We're just applying this hidden source into what Tom Bearden calls a phase conjugated mirror. We get our output and here we see this reactive component. This is reactive power here because what comes into our transformer is coming back out. And if our transformers are operating at very high efficiency, we're gonna get a lot of power coming back. It's not excess energy, it's just that the power we put into it, we get back. And then we take some of that power on the output of our device and we send that back into the input and the objective is to keep our batteries charged all the time. All right? This is our fundamental principle of our smart pack, what I call the smart pack system. And the smart pack system is a concept that I came up a number of years ago working in this field. Okay, this is real test data, what I have here on this chart, of a classic transformer and, and one of my first generation transformers here. And uh, classic transformer, yeah, you're gonna see this. You know, 85% efficiency. You pick up any s transformer off the shelf, you're gonna see you know, something around 85% efficiency, all right? Our transformers, you know, hey, wait a minute here, 129%. <laughs> hundred twenty nine percent and that's what we measure we do the same calculations and we see that our efficiency is over a hundred percent and if you want to see it I'll show it to you I got a transformer up there right now a power transformer that is putting out watts all right that's 
200, about 250 percent over unity. Okay, just doing these calculations. And once you know the philosophy behind these devices, they're not that complicated. The Floyd Sweet, once you understand the principles behind this, the Floyd Sweet device really isn't that complicated. So this is what we're doing. We have a bifiler configuration on our output stage. Now, in any bifiler configuration, you can look it up on the internet. Tom Valone has been talking about bifiler com uh, configurations for a long time. Uh, the whole key to a bifiler configuration is that you have to get flux into that bifiler. You know, that's the trick: is getting flux into that coil. All right, and that's what we're doing here into this bifiler configuration on our transformers. We get flux here and we get flux here. You say, hey, wait a minute, Floyd Sweet's doing something like that too. But he's doing it on the primary side. So what we have here is a couple of different designs for producing over unity type devices. Here, it's on the output stage, on the secondary stage, where we set up our opposing forces, our opposing flux fields. And that's what we have here, is opposing magnetomotive force. You got that going on, you gotta have this. But Floyd is doing it on the primary side, and he's you know, getting huge efficiency. So we got a number of different configurations we can play with. This one is operating upstairs. You can, you can see this one. You know, 250% under load now. All right, 250% pumping out watts under load. Okay, and when I, what I mean by under load is of course a resistive load, you know, attached to the transformer. So this is how we determine efficiency. The input side on our transformers look like an inductor. It's highly reactive. And we look at these phase angles between voltage and current. This is what we're doing here. So we say for a normal transformer, you know, you're going to see a phase angle under 90 degrees. Net efficiency is going to be always positive. At a phase angle of 90 degrees, which we can do with our transformers, Efficiency is infinite. Phase angle greater than 90 degrees, what's beyond inf infinity? Negative efficiency, because it's just the way the calculation works. The cosine of, of the angle between the voltage and the current is over 90 degrees, and that number of a cosine of that number is always negative. So that's how you get a negative efficiency. You know, it's like a negative temperature. You hear a physicist sometimes talking about negative temperature. You know, what the heck is that? You know, well, we have negative efficiency. It's probably it's something along a similar line. Okay, so that when we, when we map out, when we chart our SFT, and that's what I call it, the split flux transformer. It's our bifiler transformer. When we plot the phase angle versus the efficiency, we get something that looks like this. You know, it, it has a different operating characteristic than a normal, all normal transformers, traditional transformers, have this behavior. And they're all under 100%. But our transformers have this behavior. And what's beyond infinity? Okay, you have this negative behavior there, this negative efficiency taking place. And this happens, this negative efficiency happens when I short the output on that transformer. And this is what we have our patent on. Okay, this is our smart pack system. That's our transformer that plugs into it. And this is our energy management system. This is what we can hook on, you know, practically anything. Anything that's DC operated. The technology can be scaled down or can be scaled up. This is a double battery configuration where one is used as a power source and the other one's going to be charged. 
This was my original smart pack configuration that I developed about maybe 10 years ago. Okay, applications of this technology. Any deal is going to be a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar deal. All right? When you just look at one tiny little market, okay, of these electric bikes, and we show them out there at our display, we see that China, they already sold 200 million electric, electric bikes, and their projections, 450 million electric bikes to be sold by 2020, and every one of those bikes has to be plugged into the grid, but not with our tech. Oh no. Yeah, so the grid, you know, the power company that's sitting there, they're clapping their hands. Yeah, electric vehicles, yeah, we love that. The Tesla, everyone, every electric vehicle has to be plugged into the grid, but not with our tech. A self-charging electric scooter. That's pretty amazing. That's what we're working towards. Just a hundred watt, just the marketplace for a hundred watt system, which is going to be our first introduction here, is, is incredible. It has a little 500 watt electric motor on the front end. I ride it practically every other day. I get my, sometimes I get my little donut and coffee. <laughs> I ride, I take out my electric scooter. Reach a speed, maximum speed of 20 miles per hour. You really don't want to go over that. That has a range of about 25 miles. And of course, that range is going to increase with our technology. Uh, this is the schematic of an electric bike. So it shows a smart pack system here. Batteries, motor, controller, motor, headlights. Pretty simple, basic configuration. So it's very easy. It, it's mainly a four-wire connection although it looks a little complicated there, but it's really a, a four-wire connection. Um, Aurora and I, we came up with this concept called Jetson Motors. You know, because I used to love the Jetsons. You know, love the Jetson cartoons. You know, uh, George Jetson, you know, and they fly around in their flying cars. Of course, our technology will lead into that. Um, so yeah, Jetson Motors, that's a cool name. And so uh, we created this concept where you can get involved as an entrepreneur. You can get involved with uh, Jets and Motor franchises. You, know, you can become a seller of our products and open up a, a Jets and franchise, okay, selling electric vehicles made by Aurora Tech. So just contact us, you know, if you're interested. Uh, Roy and I, we do a, a weekly radio show, typically on Sunday evenings. Uh, if you want to hear what we're talking about, we get the latest and greatest news about Aurora Tech. And um, you can listen in. We're on Blog Talk Radio. Vortex Network News is our uh, website. And there's my contact info. So that's how you can reach us. And that is my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you very much for your time. It's time now for our question and answer session. If you could say your name and where you're from. I'm Damien from San Diego. And I had a question about uh, your uh, diagram, it showed the, the secondary, how it had secondary one and secondary two. And I was just, yeah, right there. And I was just curious yeah. how the primary couples to that secondary. Well, the primary stage is just, it looks like a regular transformer, all right? It just, uh, it has the primary coil, all right? And it splits the flux. It looks like a, uh, a normal standard transformer you pick up off the shelf where you have the primary winding and it, they split the flux, all right? And that's what we're doing there. 
when we split the flux, that's this path up here and the path down here. And that's a necessary component for building these free energy devices because you're getting energy, you're, you know, you want to get energy into a bifiler arrangement like this. Floyd Suite is pretty much the same deal. Okay, and okay. then um, does a primary wrap around yeah. the outside? And we're setting up these pump fields, okay? We're pumping the material. And you have to have that in order for Faraday's law to work in this situation. Faraday's law is, is at work here, okay? Because you have this opposing magnetic configuration here, now I can produce an output voltage and obey Faraday's law. Okay. Sterling. Sterling Allen of PESN. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, first of all, on the, uh, you're talking about you're producing watts right now. Yes. And you've got scooters out there that are going to take uh, hundreds of watts on, mm -hmm. on the low end. Right. And um, it's taken you, you've been working since November on this to get to a few watts. I'm just curious. Right to kind of extrapolate how much time you're expecting mm -hmm. to be to the point where you're going to produce the hundreds of watts needed to power a scooter. Right. Yeah, that's, that's what the roar are there. <laughs> okay. Whenever you do development work, and I've been involved with developing electronics, developing software, there's always a schedule you work with, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm very methodical in my work. Okay, I take it stage by stage by stage. Okay, here I develop the hardware. I couldn't really debug the hardware because I don't have any software yet. So I had to develop the software. The software took about maybe five months to write. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then after the software, I had to build the transformers because I really can't test the transformers unless I have the, you know, the hardware and the software. So now, I have the transformers, now that stage, I can test the transformers, but I got to debug the hardware to make sure the whole thing plays together. And this is why it's taking, you know, I mean, a typical software project, you know, you're looking at six months to a year. You know, I develop software for, you know, the major corporations. You know, it'd take a long time to write code. Right, so that said, we understand that it takes but yes. You know, there's a process See, I'm involved. going in steps, yeah. starting with the smaller power levels. I mean, my first, uh, that, that table you saw of the test data, that was my first generation core. That's, I've been demoing that for months last year. Okay, that test data of 129%. That transformer only put out milliwatts. Now I'm producing watts. Okay, because I start to understand the geometry, you know, how these transformers are working. Because then you've got to scale certain components of that transformer. You know, the coils, the gauge of the coils, uh, and the material that I'm using. You know, it's much more robust than, you know, my first level. You know, and, and the 250, going from 250 to 3,000 watts, you know, that's bigger material. And then I'm looking at transitioning, okay, from the Thane Hines type of architecture to the Floyd Sweet architecture on these transformers, okay, because it's looking like the Floyd Sweet is much more efficient, okay, in his architecture, how he arranges the magnetic material and the coils, because he's pumping the primary side. Okay, really quick. The second question is just regarding Floyd or um, Thane Hines, yes. who's done a lot of the groundwork on this that you recognize and acknowledge his efforts. Is he involved um, on the business level with you? How is, is he going to be taken care of? No. Um, now, the, uh, if you look at the architecture of the Thane Hines, if you look at his patents, because they look like they have. You know, there's always some sort of limitations, you know, what people present. And if you try to build this, and I've, I, I have seen people try to replicate Thane Hines device, it, do, it doesn't work very well. You know, he doesn't really show the flux 
the flux has to get, and it has to be balanced, the flux to the two secondaries. He's got the secondary stage here and second stage here. He doesn't show the flux getting to this third coil in his arrangement, and I've seen people try to replicate it and see this thing doesn't work. But if you end up uh, with these designs and modify them, okay, you can get it to work. So that's what we're looking at here. Hi, I'm Brian Panette from Massachusetts. Uh, I have a two-part question about conditioning the magnet in uh, right. Floyd Sweet's uh, device. Well, first of all, when you say the magnet softens, do you mean mm -hmm. physically soften, or do you mean that the top layer of the magnet becomes magnetically demagnetized? And the second part yeah, of the question is, what is demagnetizing? The top layer? The surface, yeah, okay. because what you have is a hard, if you take just a regular bearing ferrite magnet, mm -hmm. it's a hard, highly coercive force, okay, involved there, uh, a permanent magnet, okay? And then what Floyd Sweet did is that he softened the surface. And could you tell me what that process was to condition it? Is it easy he was to pulsing it. I'm pulsing it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's some videos on his apparatus. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm uh, Alex Johnson from Colorado. And I was wondering, when you're saying you're setting up uh, phase conjugate magnetic fields, uh, are you speaking of bucking magnetic fields, like north to north and south to south, or are you closing the magnetic flux on itself by using north to south all the way around? Okay, if we go back to this diagram here, this shows the configuration. Okay, you have the barium magnet here and here. And of course, the surface on this side, it's been softened so that you have to get opposing flux into that softened material for this to work. Okay, that's the whole concept behind this free energy, are opposing forces in the materials. So like bucking magnetic fields? As in like the same polarity? Yeah, well bucking ma magnetic field, you run across that with ordinary power supplies. Okay, you know, if you look up the architecture of a regular power supply, this is different, you know, we're not doing that. You know, we're, we're setting up these uh, opposing forces in the materials. And then we're seeing these effects. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Mark, <coughs> I'm Mark Hulkin here from Albuquerque, uh, otherwise known as Helios. Um, <clears throat> right now, Bill, does the science provide you enough as you've advanced it uh, at this point to, to be able to make any solid projections about when you would actually get to say a 250 or a 500 power, a power up, stand, a standalone power up system? Well, <coughs> see, with my engineering background, I like to have deadlines. And if I can meet those deadlines, that's terrific. Because it gets my mind going on the objective. And the objective is to meet this delivery, you know, on this device, okay? But, you know, what you're working with here is a device that really, I mean, it's been around for a long time, but it's not in mainstream science. You're not going to open a textbook, you know, and, and find any of this material. So, you know, I'm proceeding along the lines of using my experience producing this device, and I can only project, you know, I try to project, you know, a delivery on these type of devices. And if I can meet that, you know, that's, that's terrific. So, so but right now, you know, we're, we're, we're leaning towards this 100 watt device and get that to a commercial stage. Now, will there, be, will there be some transductive elements like negative resistors that will help quicken or expand the upscaling of, of output? Um, like negative. the negative resistor or other barrier transistors that you would be employing or exotic transductive elements that you need to still? Well, everything that we're using, all the technology, it, it's off-the-shelf tech. You know, I mean, there's nothing here that's exotic. 
So you anticipate eventually being able to get to even thousands of watts using off-the-shelf oh, yeah. components? Yeah, the technology, I already have it scaled up producing watts. Yeah. Okay, now, you know, after this stage, you know, we're, we want to take it up to 250 watts because we have uh, uh, some customers down in Haiti that are very interested in our technology. Mm -hmm. Third world countries are going to really benefit, okay, from this tech. Mike Riley, South Carolina. I'm curious, is your smart pack board available for purchase? It's going to be. What I have out there are my development stations. Okay. Okay, the hardware and software that's being developed. That's, yeah, I, I th that's my platform. I followed your smart pack for a while, mm -hmm. and I've been trying to you know, find where I could get one. Yeah, well, it's going to be coming out the commercial stage. Um, because I got to take the board and then miniaturize the board um, using SMD technology and uh, get it to the point where I got to finalize, okay, this is the design, this is what we're going with. And it's going to work for many different transformer configurations and sizes. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh, we got one more. We, we already answered that. That's five months. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, one more time. How long before the 100 watt device is for sale? Well, we, uh, you know, I was asked that, um, you may have heard of uh, Graham Gunderson. Okay, he's a researcher, he stopped by our place, gave a demonstration, and uh, he's a pretty sharp, bright guy. Uh, and Graham um, was asking, you know, you got, uh, you got a pretty tight schedule. I, and I said, Graham, we have a very aggressive schedule, okay? I mean, I am all out for this tech. I mean, I am moving as fast as I can developing this technology, okay, okay. from an engineering standpoint, and it's going to be solid, all right? It's not going to be something that's hacked together, I'm like Scott most Allen. experimenters would put together. I'm Scott Allen from Tyler, Texas, and uh, uh, the uh, follow-up is... Uh, are you, uh, you guys distributing it yourself? Or are you selling distributorships like Dennis Lee? Well, you know, we've been approached all over the world here by people that, you know, they want um, royalties or, you know, pay royalties, you know, where they manufacture. Uh, Roy and I, we want to lean towards um, that we control, you know, we have the controlling interest a corporation because we want to get this technology out there so we don't want it to be stopped to be blocked some billionaire comes on I get a call from a billionaire says Billy is ten million dollars you know <laughs> and I said forget it yeah, I'm not gonna take it I'm not interested in ten million dollars because this is a multi billion if not a trillion dollar business okay transforming the planet I mean, this is really cool. Well, thank you very much, William Alec. That was great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you stick around for just a moment, we'll do another drawing.